Good afternoon. NATO leaders will uh, meet in Brussels tomorrow at the pivotal moment for our security. And I look forward to welcoming President Zelensky, who will address us uh, during the meeting. President Putin's brutal invasion of Ukraine is causing death and destruction every day. Allies stand united in support for the brave people of Ukraine and against the Kremlin's cruelty. Putin must end this war, allow aid and safe passage of civilians, and engage in real diplomacy. NATO allies have responded to this crisis with strong support for Ukraine and unprecedented costs for Russia. NATO has acted with speed and unity to protect and defend all allies. There are now hundreds of thousands of Allied troops at heightened readiness across the alliance. 100,000 US troops in Europe and 40,000 forces under direct NATO command, mostly in the eastern part of the alliance. All backed by major air and naval power, including with five carrier strike groups in the high north and in the Mediterranean. At the summit tomorrow, we will make further decisions. I expect leaders will agree to strengthen NATO's posture in all domains, with major increases to our forces in the eastern part of the alliance, on land, in the air, and at sea. The first step is the deployment of four new NATO battle groups in Bulgaria, Hungary, Romania, and Slovakia, along with our existing forces in the Baltic countries and Poland. This means that we will have eight multinational NATO battle groups all along the eastern flank from the Baltic to the Black Sea. We face a new reality for our security. So we must reset our deterrence and defense for the longer term. Tomorrow, NATO leaders will reaffirm our support to Ukraine. Ukraine has the right to self-defense under, the NATO, uh, under the UN Charter. And we are helping Ukrainians to uphold this fundamental right. Since 2014, allies have trained Ukraine's armed forces and significantly strengthened their capabilities. They are putting that training into practice now on the front lines with great bravery. In the last months, allies have stepped up military support, providing anti-tank and air defense systems, drones, fuel and ammunition, as well as financial aid and hosting millions of refugees. Tomorrow, I expect allies will agree to provide additional support, including cybersecurity assistance, as well as equipment to help Ukraine protect against chemical, biological, and radiological and nuclear threats. President Putin's invasion is brutal, and the human suffering is horrifying and painful to witness. We are determined to do all we can to support Ukraine. But we have a responsibility to ensure that the war does not escalate beyond Ukraine and become a conflict between NATO and Russia. This would cause even more death and even more destruction. 
I also expect we will agree to step up tailored support for other partners at risk from a Russian pressure, including Georgia and Bosnia-Herzegovina. Working together with the European Union, we must help them to uphold their sovereignty and the right to make independent decisions. We face a fundamentally changed security environment where authoritarian powers are increasingly prepared to use force to get their way. So I expect we will also address the role of China in this crisis. Beijing has joined Moscow in questioning the right of independent nations to choose, to choose their own path. China has provided Russia with political support, including by spreading blatant lies and disinformation. And allies are concerned that China could provide material support for the Russian invasion. I expect leaders will call on China to live up to its responsibilities as a member of the UN Security Council, refrain from supporting Russia's war effort and join the rest of the world in calling for an immediate peaceful end to this war. We also call on Belarus to end its complicity in Putin's invasion. The decisions we take tomorrow will have far-reaching implications. Major reinforcements to our security will require major investments in defense. So I expect allies will agree to redouble their efforts to invest more. There is a new sense of urgency because we cannot take peace for granted. From the start of this crisis, Europe and North America have stood together, united in NATO, and we, may, and we remain united, opposing Russia's aggression, supporting Ukraine, and protecting all allies. And with that, I'm ready to take your questions. Okay, we'll start with uh, CNN, lady over there. Thank you, Natasha Bertram of CNN. Um, Mr. Secretary General, Estonia has been calling for NATO to build up a permanent force in the region that is capable of stopping a Russian offensive, offensive but the NATO-Russia Founding Act technically does not allow the alliance to establish permanent military basing in so-called new member states. And so I'm wondering if you believe that it's time to repeal the NATO-Russia Founding Act, given its invasion of Ukraine, and I'm also wondering, Estonia's defense chief had also said that NATO should get involved directly if Russia uses weapons of mass destruction, like chemical weapons, and I'm wondering if these kinds of red lines and how NATO would react if they were crossed are going to be discussed. Um, first of all, we have to remember that we, over the last weeks, have uh, deployed a substantial number of combat ready troops to the eastern part of the lines. Unprecedented NATO presence in the Baltic region, including in Estonia. And I've been in Estonia myself and I've seen the NATO troops there. We have actually doubled the size of the NATO battle group and we have doubled the number of battle groups in the eastern part of the lines. So not only doubled the size, but also doubled the number of battle groups. Uh, close to 40,000 uh, uh, troops under direct NATO command, and then on top of that, uh, increased the presence by the United States and others on, uh, 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 within the bilateral arrangements. So in totality, this is a significant reinforcement of our presence in the East, including in Estonia, uh, with air, sea and land forces. And uh, we, have, uh, we are ready uh, and we are there to protect and defend allies, ready to uh, respond massively to any potential threat attack against any NATO allied country. This has already happened. So this, is, this, is, this reinforcement has, has already taken place. And uh, we will then also tomorrow make decisions uh, and uh, declare the, that we have deployed four more battle groups to, uh, to Slovakia, Hungary. Hungary Bulgaria and, uh, and, and, and Romania. Then, there is a need to also address the more long-term consequences. So, in addition to what we have already done, 
Uh, I expect also Allied leaders uh, tomorrow to agree a tasking to our military commanders uh, to look into the more longer-term consequences for our deterrence and defence. There is a need to reset our deterrence and defence, and I expect that to be a substantial increase in our presence for the long term. Uh, and we will do what is necessary to ensure that we protect and defend all allies and ensure that uh, NATO uh, uh, provides credible deterrence and defence uh, to all countries, including uh, 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 Estonia. Russia has walked away from the NATO-Russia Funding Act. They have violated it again and again. They violated it clearly back in 2014 when they uh, illegally annexed Crimea and started to destabilize eastern Ukraine. And they have violated it when they um, uh, moved into Georgia in 2008. And of course, the invasion of Ukraine uh, now is a blatant violation of the NATO-Russia Founding Act. On, um, on chemical weapons, also, first of all, any use of chemical weapons would, would, would totally change the nature of the conflict. And it will be a blatant violation of uh, international law and will have far-reaching consequences. And I, think, and I think that's the most important message to convey, uh, that uh, uh, any use of chemical weapons is, is absolutely unacceptable and will have far-reaching consequences. We'll go to NBC, lady in red in the middle. Yeah. Uh, Secretary General, President Biden in leaving Washington just said that he believes that the use of chemical weapons by Russia in Ukraine is a real threat. Uh, you have just said that we cannot take peace for granted and there is no sign, certainly, uh, that Vladimir Putin is taking diplomacy seriously. And here we have President Zelensky who will plead again with NATO for admission to NATO. If chemical weapons are used in Ukraine, how would it be morally acceptable for NATO to ignore President Zelensky's plea for NATO admission? For NATO? For NATO admission. To ignore his plea to be admitted to NATO. Thank you, sir. What we see in, in Ukraine now is is really painful. It, it's horrific, and, and, and we see the brutal consequences of a full-fledged invasion of a peaceful, independent, sovereign nation. And that's also the reason why NATO allies have stepped up support, including with advanced uh, air defense systems, anti-tank systems, uh, uh, different types of weapons, uh, ammunition, and and we are providing unprecedented support to Ukraine. And this is actually also comes on top of what we have done for many years. Because NATO allies have trained tens of thousands of Ukrainian troops since 2014. Uh, and they are now on the front line uh, fighting the invading forces. And uh, it is first and foremost the, the, the courage of the Ukrainian forces and the Ukrainian people and the Ukrainian leadership that has enabled them to uh, resist and to fight back against uh, the uh, Russian invasion. Uh, but at the same time, the support they have received for many years uh, has proven extremely important and uh, critical. And I uh, expect that when Allied leaders meet tomorrow, they will uh, address how to further strengthen our support to, uh, to, uh, to Ukraine. Um, NATO membership is not on, on the agenda. Uh, but support to Ukraine is absolutely on top of our agenda and will be one of the main, main issues to be addressed uh, tomorrow. Okay. Sky. Thank you. Secretary General, thank you very much. Mark Stone from, from Sky News. Um, could you explain or could, could you outline how NATO defends itself against a nuclear attack? Because it's clear that on Russian state media, they are openly propagandists, pundits, people close to the Kremlin are now talking in pretty straight and stark terms about a nuclear attack. How does NATO defend itself against a nuclear attack? Thank you. Russia must stop its 
nuclear saber rattling. This is dangerous and it is irresponsible. NATO is there to protect and defend all allies, and we convey a very clear message to Russia that the nuclear war can not be won and should never be fought. And um, uh, uh, it just highlights the importance of ending the war in Ukraine, because we need to do everything we can to prevent the war from escalating beyond Ukraine and becoming even more deadly and even more dangerous than uh, what we see today. Um, any use of nuclear weapons will fundamentally change the nature of the conflict, and Russia must understand that a nuclear war should never be fought and, never, and they can never win a nuclear war. Um, this is actually something that Russia has agreed to again and again, and uh, the continued nuclear saber rattling from uh, uh, Russia, the, the nuclear rhetoric is actually contradicting what they have stated uh, in the UN and in other uh, formats, uh, agreeing that we should uh, do whatever we can to prevent a nuclear uh, conflict. Okay. Al Jazeera. Secretary General, staying with weapons of mass destruction, you said in your opening statement on chemical and biological weapons that you were thinking of equipment to protect Ukraine. Can you give us more details of what you're going to be proposing to the leaders tomorrow? So we have provided different types of support, uh, also when it comes to uh, different measures to protect uh, against uh, chemical uh, uh, weapons. Uh, and uh, I expect the Allies to look into how they can step up and provide more uh, uh, equipment to uh, protect and de defend against uh, chemical weapons. I, think, I don't think it's useful if I go into all the details, partly because uh, allies will discuss this tomorrow, but also partly because I think that when it comes to the details about exactly what kind of support we provide, it's actually uh, not always the best thing to be too detailed about that. We provide support, we are stepping up our support, and uh, we are uh, uh, concerned about the possibility of uh, use of chemical weapons or biological weapons. We've also seen not only the nuclear rhetoric from the Russian side, but also these false claims that, that Ukraine, supported by NATO allies, are uh, producing and preparing for the use of chemical weapons. This is an absolute false accusation, but it, 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 it may be a way for them to, in a way, try to create a pretext for their use of chemical uh, weapons. Uh, Russia has used chemical agents before against their own opposition and also on NATO allied territory in Salisbury. And Russia was, of course, part of the use of chemical weapons in Syria. They facilitated and supported the Assad regime, which has actually used chemical weapons several times. So we are concerned, and that's also the reason why we are uh, ready and, 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 and will uh, address tomorrow um, uh, ways to provide uh, support to Ukraine to protect themselves against uh, the use of chemical weapons. And let me add that, of course, this is extremely serious for the people of Ukraine. But any use of chemical weapons or biological weapons may also have direct consequences for NATO allied countries, people living there. The contamination, um, the spread of chemical or biological agents used in Ukraine may have direct consequences also, also for the population living in, living in NATO other countries in Europe. So it just underscores the seriousness of, uh, of our concerns. Okay, we'll go to Interfax Ukraine. The lady in red with glasses in the middle. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much. Irina Sommer, News Agency, Interfax Ukraine. Secretary General, um, according to NATO and US officials, Belarus is ready to send the troops into the war against Ukraine. What it will change for Ukrainians and what it will change for NATO? And my second question is about coalition. Um, mass media already reported that Poland leadership are ready to put tomorrow for discussion a proposal to send a peacekeeping mission to Ukraine. They mentioned NATO peacekeeping mission to Ukraine. But how about coalition? Um, coming back to 2003, a coalition were created
from three NATO alliances and one non-NATO country in Iraq. Do you think it will be a good solution to create a coalition of countries who wants to fight for Ukraine without NATO involvement? Thank you. So first of Belarus, Belarus has been a complicit to this invasion from the start, actually before the start, because uh, Belarus allowed its territory to be used as a uh, ground for mobilizing uh, massing troops that uh, invaded uh, Ukraine. Uh, and uh, Belarus continues to uh, enable uh, the invasion um, by providing the territory, airfields, military infrastructure, bases, but also by allowing Russia to use uh, Belarusian airspace to launch attacks every night, every day against uh, uh, Ukrainian cities, against Ukrainian civilians, against uh, uh, the, the, the Ukrainian uh, nation. So Ukraine, uh, sorry, Belarus is already, already heavily involved in the way that uh, uh, it has been uh, 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 complicit and, and, and has supported the, uh, the, the, the Russian uh, invasion. And of course, we call on Belarus to stop doing exactly that uh, and not be used by Russia uh, to conduct this brutal war against a uh, neighbor, uh, Ukraine. Um, when it comes to forces, so NATO is not part of the conflict. We provide support to Ukraine, but we're not part of the conflict. We, we help uh, Ukraine with upholding their right for self-defense, which is enshrined in the UN Charter. Uh, but uh, NATO will not send troops uh, into, uh, into Ukraine. Uh, we have to understand that it is extremely important to provide support to Ukraine, and we are stepping up. But at the same time, it is also extremely important to prevent that this conflict becomes a full-fledged war between uh, NATO and, uh, and, uh, and Russia. And therefore, it has been a very clear uh, message uh, from NATO allies that we will not send troops to Ukraine. We have a Polish radio lady at the back. Thank you very much, Anna. Beata Pomecka, Polskie Radio, Polish uh, Public Broadcaster. Uh, Secretary General, if I may ask about, again about uh, enhancing the forward presence on the eastern flank, is it a time to consider or to decide to enlarge the battalions that are in Baltic states and Poland into the brigade groups? And also uh, follow up to the, to the question concerning nuclear threats repeated again and again by Russia. Is there a possibility to, for the leaders to prepare a kind of a plan, just in case? Thank you very much. First on the nuclear threat, NATO has plans in place to protect all allies against any threat. But our main message is that Russia should stop this dangerous, irresponsible nuclear rhetoric. Uh, but, there, but, 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 there, but let there be no doubt about our readiness to protect and defend allies against any threat, any attack. Um, and of course, we have plans in place to do exactly that. Um, on uh, on uh, the size, well, first of all, so before this invasion, we had four battle groups, battalion sized. Now we have doubled the size of those battle groups in Poland, in Lithuania, in Estonia, and in, the, in, the, in Latvia. And then we have doubled the number of battle groups uh, with the, the new battle groups uh, in Slovakia, Hungary, Bulgaria, and Romania, uh, which uh, the leaders will then uh, announce uh, uh, tomorrow. Um, uh, and there are more, in Poland there are also additional troops from the US. Uh, I recently visited uh, uh, the Vosk Air Base. I met with US uh, and, uh, and other pilots. Uh, so there, there has been a in significant increase of, of, uh, of NATO allies, especially the United States, presence in the eastern part of the alliance. This is our uh, immediate response, has already taken place. Then I think we need to separate that a bit from the more longer term adaptation of our alliance. And we will spend some time now, from now until the summit uh, in June, 
to make uh, 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 more fundamental uh, decisions our, on our deterrence and defense. It's about resetting our deterrence and defense, especially in the East. And there I expect that uh, a part of that will be a significant increase of our presence on the ground in the eastern part of the Alliance uh, for the long term. So immediately we have done a lot. Uh, then we will start the process of more uh, 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 long-term changes in our deterrence and defense, which will be lasting and, uh, and, and, and most likely uh, will then include also a significant increase of the size of the presence of uh, the NATO multinational uh, forces in the eastern part of the lines, including in uh, Poland. Okay, we'll go to Chas from Ukraine. Gentleman. Gentleman in blue. Yeah. <laughs> Secretary General, I, do you believe in the successful and fruitful, fruitful summit tomorrow, taking on account the position of Hungary, as you know, that they are going to block the main issues you will put on the table tomorrow concerning uh, of the help to Ukraine? Well, I believe it will be an important summit tomorrow, an extraordinary NATO summit in an extraordinary security situation, where we face the biggest security threat uh, for a generation since, since actually the, the end of the Second World War. Um, and, um, and therefore, I, I, I believe this is an important meeting, and I'm confident that allies will agree uh, on important issues, including on the, the importance of providing support to Ukraine, uh, strengthening our own deterrence and defense, and also provide support to other partners which are now under pressure from Russia, for instance, Georgia and Bosnia-Herzegovina. Um, and, uh, and I uh, expect all allies to agree, uh, all 30. Okay, we'll go to Politico. Uh, a lady here. Thank you. Second row. Um, thank you very much, Secretary General. I'm Lily Beyer from Politico. Um, some NATO allies have expressed an interest in having you potentially stay on for an extra year in your current role, given the current situation. Would you be open to staying in your current job another year? Thank you. This is for 30 allies uh, to uh, decide. Uh, my focus is on preparing the summit tomorrow uh, in the midst of the most... Uh, serious security situation uh, we have been in for decades. And that's my focus. And then I leave it to the allies to decide on the other things. Okay. We'll go to uh, Afghan voice, lady in green. Thank you very much, Oana. Uh, Leila Mossadid from Brussels Morning. Um, I'm sorry. I, I know this is a very tough uh, situation. I would like uh, to ask a question about Afghanistan. Uh, which is disappeared from meetings and also from news, uh, unfortunately. Uh, actually, today, millions of girls and women were waiting to open the schools and university in Afghanistan, but unfortunately, it's not happened. And I believe the Taliban, as a terrorist group, they never changed because they didn't cut their tie with Al-Qaeda and also with Aqani Network. So... In a country, the women are disappeared from the society, and also there is no woman right, human right, and also freedom of expression, and also uh, liberty at all. Uh, they are killing, raping, and also torturing and uh, imprisoning the people in Afghanistan. Uh, why is it acceptable and attractive for for, for EU and also for NATO. Thank you. I think it is very important that we don't forget Afghanistan. Um, and uh, it is especially important that we don't forget that uh, education is a fundamental human right. And of course, that also applies for uh, girls, for women. And uh, it was one of the biggest achievements of the last 20 years that uh, millions of Afghan uh, girls are, were able to attend school and to get uh, education. And uh, any uh, attempt to deny girls in Afghanistan education uh, will be a violation of what Taliban has promised. 
and we have to hold them accountable for what they promised and their commitments, including on the right for education to uh, women. Um, uh, therefore, I agree with the disappointment expressed by uh, the United Nations, and I also uh, strongly uh, believe that we uh, must continue uh, to uh, support uh, all Afghans who are working to uphold the right for, uh, for, for human rights, uh, uh, for the freedom of speech, but including also the right for education for uh, women. Okay, we had a Financial Times over there. Yes, over there. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much. Um, Secretary General, you mentioned um, China. Uh, do you personally consider China to be an ally of Russia in this conflict? And what would you like to see from NATO uh, member states uh, in terms of real actions that could pressure China into ceasing its support for Russia? Thank you. So what we have seen is that uh, China has uh, not been able to condemn the invasion. Uh, they abstained in the UN uh, General Assembly on the vote on the resolution clearly condemning uh, the invasion. We have also seen that uh, uh, Chinese uh, state uh, authorities have uh, uh, spread the, some, some of the same lies about Ukraine uh, and about NATO, um, and in that way provide the political support to, uh, to Russia. And of course for NATO it is of particular concern that uh, China now for the first time has questioned some of the key principles for our security, including the right for every nation in Europe to choose its own path. Because in the joint statement, between uh, President Xi and President Putin, uh, they actually uh, together um, um, state that they uh, are uh, against any further enlargement of, uh, of NATO. And that's new. Partly that they work so closely together, and partly that uh, China joins Russia in trying to deny uh, European nations the freedom to choose their own uh, path. Uh, and therefore, we call on Russia, and I expect the leaders, when they meet tomorrow, to call on Russia. Uh, sorry to call on China, uh, to condemn the invasion and uh, to uh, uh, engage in diplomatic efforts to find a peaceful uh, way to end this war as soon as possible. Okay, we had, uh, and not you... provide material support. Yeah, sorry. Ukrainian State TV? Yeah. Matsuka, Ukrainian State TV, TV. My question about do you know about real Ukraine's defense needs and do you have clear priorities what Ukrainians need today? Do you, have, uh, do you know about the disappointment disappoint of Ukrainians in NATO now and how do you explain your strategy to average people in Ukraine who now are under shelling in Kyiv and in other cities? What we see in Ukraine is horrific. It's, it's, it's painful even for us to watch. And then, of course, it's even worse for those who are there. Uh, and, uh, and, and the human suffering and the scale of violence uh, is something we have not seen since the Second World War in, uh, in Europe. Um, NATO allies are in close contact um, at different levels with uh, Ukraine with President Zelensky, with the uh, ministers. Uh, we had uh, the Ukrainian uh, defense minister participating in our defense ministerial last week. Tomorrow, uh, President Zelensky will address the uh, NATO summit. And uh, as we all know, President Zelensky and other Ukrainian officials are addressing different uh, uh, political bodies in different uh, countries uh, in, uh, across the alliance uh, almost uh, daily. And by doing that and by having the close uh, uh, contact at many different levels. Uh, we also uh, are informed uh, about the needs for uh, different types of help, uh, financial support, humanitarian support, but also, of course, uh, military support. And allies are stepping up with military, with financial, with humanitarian uh, 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 support. Then, then, then we are aware of, uh, uh, because uh, this is something which President Zelensky and the Ukrainian officials have expressed several times to us, that they are grateful for the support, but they want us to do even more. Uh, we are ready to step up in many ways, uh, but for instance, um, uh, on uh, the call for a no-fly zone, we have stated that uh, we are not going to impose a no-fly zone uh, because we believe uh, that that will uh, most likely trigger a full-fledged war between 
NATO and the Ukraine. Uh, a no-fly zone uh, means that we need to take out Russian air defense systems uh, in Russia, which are covering the airspace over Ukraine. And it means that we have to be ready to shoot down uh, Russian planes. And that will most likely lead to a full-fledged uh, conflict. So we are in regular, almost daily contact with uh, Ukraine. Ukraine is a highly valued partner. We have worked with Ukraine for many years. I've been there many times myself. Um, and, and it is horrific and, 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 and really hard to watch. Uh, and that's also the reason why allies have um, also provide so much, uh, provide support, but also have imposed unprecedented sanctions on Russia uh, to ensure that this war ends. Okay. Associated Press. Lauren Cook, Associated Press. On the, the battle groups, please, for Hungary, Slovakia, or Romania, and Bulgaria, could you give us a sense of when they're supposed to arrive? I imagine circumstances are, are, are urgent, and how long they might stay. Is this something that we're looking at for several years or just until this conflict has died down? And then within that, uh, there was a question. I think Hungary didn't necessarily want uh, other troops there. How's, how's that going to work? Thank you. Well, so these battle groups are now actually uh, there. Uh, uh, we are increasing. We, they are becoming more and more integrated and more and more operational. Uh, uh, so, but the forces are... Uh, all that is also, at least to a large extent, all that is there. Um, uh, um, uh, and they are going to be uh, NATO multinational battle groups. Um, uh, there will be, of course, uh, an important component of the national uh, 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 home defense forces will be part of the battle group, but then there will be other NATO allies also contributing uh, forces. Um, um, again, this is part of our immediate reaction. So this is something which, has, which is happening now. Uh, as part, together with, with all the other things we have done, it, as a, it's, a, it's hundreds, hundreds of thousands of uh, NATO troops on heightened alert, uh, roughly 100,000 U.S. troops in, in, uh, in Europe now, many of them in the eastern part of the alliance, um, um, and that is significantly more than before the crisis, and then uh, around 40,000 uh, uh, troops on the direct NATO command, uh, and all of this is, is, uh, is, the, is the immediate response to the, to the uh, Russian invasion of uh, Ukraine. We will, we will have that in place as long as necessary. But in parallel with that, we have started the process to reset for the long term our deterrence and defense. Because it is already today possible to say that this invasion, this brutal war, war in Ukraine, would have long-term consequences for our security. It's a new normal for our security, and NATO has to respond to that new reality. Uh, but that more long-term process, will, also that process will take some more weeks, uh, but we can do that because we all have implemented a significant reinforcement of our presence in the East, and in parallel that we are addressing more long-term changes, including, most likely, significant increased presence in the air, on land, at sea, in the eastern part of the lines. Okay, we'll take two more questions, Wall Street Journal, and then we'll come down here to Bloomberg. Thank you very much, uh, Dan Michaels, Wall Street Journal. Uh, when you look at how successfully the Ukrainian troops have, have, have they been um, able to hold back the Russians in many places, uh, much the surprise of the Russians, apparently, um, partly thanks to training from NATO and NATO member states. Do you wish that over recent years NATO and its members had been able actually to do more? Do you feel that if, if more had been done that, that the situation could be different? Thank you. Um, uh, first of all, I would like to commend uh, the courage, the professionalism of the Ukrainian armed forces. I have met them uh, in Ukraine uh, and uh, uh, we are all aware that compared to where uh, they were back in 2014, this is a total different uh, force than uh, uh, eight years ago. Um, uh, the Ukrainian armed forces today, it's much bigger, much better equipped, much better trained, much better commanded, they have much better logistics uh, than they had back in 2014. And of course, all of this combined with the courage, the high morale, 
is the reason why they are really able to push back and to uh, stand up against the uh, much bigger Russian uh, invasion. Um, at the same time, I think we need, need to remember that Ukraine is, is a big nation. It's the biggest country in Europe and, uh, and more than 44 million people. So, so it's a significant nation with a strong uh, army defense force. And of course, I am, it's important that NATO allies have provided support for many years, especially the United States, uh, Canada and the United Kingdom, but also some other allies. Um, uh, uh, and also uh, believe it is important to, to understand that, uh, that, uh, that this has, we, NATO has also provided support on logistics, on command, on modernizing their, uh, their, 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 their security institutions. Into tra the transformation of the Ukrainian armed forces has been supported by also NATO as, as an institution. And for instance, Yavoriv, the, the place that was attacked, uh, is a place where we conducted uh, uh, training and support for Ukrainians. I've been there myself um, and seen how NATO allies and NATO for many years have provided uh, important support. Of course, it's always in, in, in hindsight possible to say that we should have done even more. Uh, but I, first of all, I think uh, the lesson learned is that support and help over many years have a significant impact as it had on the Ukrainian armed forces. And second, I think it also uh, is a lesson to be learned about the importance of supporting other partners which are under Russian pressure. Bloomberg. Thank you. Uh, Natalia Drozdiak from Bloomberg. I just want to go back to the, the topic of chemical weapons. Um, you mentioned last week that um, there was a risk that Russia could try to do this uh, under the cover of a false flag event. And today you're talking about allies um, sending protective equipment. What can you tell us about the threat? How has it evolved? Is it becoming more urgent or, or imminent? Thank you. We are concerned, uh, and we are concerned because uh, we see the rhetoric, uh, we see the attempts by Russia to create this uh, pretext uh, and accuse us uh, and Ukraine for preparing the use of chemical weapons. And we are concerned also because we know that Russia has used chemical agents before, and they have supported Assad and, and facilitated facilitate the use of chemical weapons in, uh, in Syria. Uh, at the same time, we, all, we, also, we, also, we, all, we are also open about our concerns to, 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 to decrease the likelihood for any use of uh, chemical weapons because that will fundamentally change the nature of the conflict. It will be a blatant violation of international uh, uh, law and it will have severe consequences uh, in a way that uh, it is important to, to uh, convey to Russia. Uh, so they don't use any chemical weapons in Ukraine, uh, both because that kind of uh, any use of a chemical weapons will have devastating consequences for Ukraine, but it could also have severe consequences for neighboring countries because any contamination or spread of chemical agents or biological agents will, of course, also potentially affect uh, neighbors. Thank you very much. This concludes this press conference. We'll see you tomorrow. Thank you. Thank you so much.